radio. Hello. Oh, there we go. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are so, yes. We are so glad you have chosen to worship with us this morning here in our parking lot. Is this not another gorgeous morning? absolutely amazing. We are so excited, so blessed. few quick reminders and updates for you. Next Sunday is the first Sunday of the month, so we will be celebrating in communion together. As you enter in for worship, you'll be handed one of these fun little communion cups. There is juice and a wafer attached, and later in that service, then we will have the opportunity to receive communion together. If you are worshiping from home next Sunday, you are welcome to have your own uh, bread and juice and whatever format that takes. Maybe it's bread and juice. Maybe it's cinnamon rolls and coffee, uh, donuts and milk, whatever it is that works for you. It isn't the specific items that are important. It's that gathering and, and the ways in which God moves through that, that creates that sacred moment. So I invite you to join us for communion next Sunday. We're going to have a few moments uh, tomorrow evening about 4.30 to meet with some of the youth of the church. So if you are interested in more information about that, be sure uh, to see me after service. Would love to help you get connected with that. We are finishing up our Into the Unknown sermon series today. And then next week we'll begin a four-week series called Once Upon a Parable. And so we'll hear some of the parables of Jesus and figure out how those connect to our lives. And finally, want to invite you again after service. If you want to come back under that portico and say hello, it helps uh, me and my family to get to know you as well as get to know some of your names. And we always love to see you and say hello. So want to offer and extend that invitation. We're excited to be here. We're excited to worship together. We're excited to see what it is that God is going to do today in our worship. And so I invite you to turn your hearts toward God as we join in worship together. As Pastor Allison said, it is exciting because as I stand here and I see all the cars and I know what's going on in the church at the soundboard, our tech crew is just doing a fantastic job. If you would just give a toot, a wave. It, uh, it really is almost beyond imagination what we're able to do uh, when we're inspired to be together. I have a little song I want to share with you this morning. Here we are gathered once again under your name, thinking of the ways we all have caused you shame. But we can find consolation in the things that you said. We're all bound in our hearts by a common thread. We look to you who made us one to give us strength and bring us back, back where our hearts, where we've begun. So together we hold all our hearts out to you, and we all can believe you know just what to do. Heal and forgive us, make us all just like new. Jesus, we hold our hearts out to you. Jesus, we hold our hearts out to you. Our call to worship this morning. God of glory, we thank you for this time together. You are the one we come to worship. Lord Jesus, we praise you for this community. You are the one we want to reflect. Holy Spirit, we offer you our hearts. You are the one we seek to guide us. We come together to praise, give thanks, and offer all we have. Amen. doing this morning? 
Good. All right, this is our children's moment time. So this is that time for kids to especially pay attention, right? Because I know you pay attention for the whole service, right? My children, yes, maybe, thinking about it. All right, so are you guys big Frozen 2 fans? Yeah, do we sing a lot of the songs in the car? A lot. Yeah, yeah, we know a lot. Um, do you have a favorite song from the movie? You like all of them? Do you have a favorite song, Nathaniel? What's your favorite? Not sure? Is it Lost in the Woods? Is that your favorite? You don't know. Okay, that's fine. Well, I, and that, that really plays in well to my next question. Do you ever have a hard time making decisions? No. Yeah, sometimes trying to decide what the next step is. Do you remember what Anna said when she had a really hard decision to make? Do you remember what she said to do? What did she say to do? The next right thing. Do you know what that means? That means we don't have to worry about how we're going to solve the whole problem. It means that when we're, we just have to think about um, what to do, how to move forward. We just have to take the next step in the right direction. And sometimes, as Christians, it's really hard to know what that next right direction looks like. Did you know that God gave us a map? God gave us, like, GPS directions, a way to know what the right things are. Did you know that? Well, this morning's scripture talks about it. And the question is asked, what do I need to do, God? What's the right thing? What are you asking of me? And God gives us three things. Do you guys remember this canvas? So when I was gone on a retreat one time and daddy was home with you guys, you made this really cool canvas and it says act, love, walk. And it has your handprints and your footprints on it. And it's the coolest thing. And it's from Micah 6, 8. We are to act justly. We're supposed to treat everybody as though they have sacred worth because they do. We treat everybody as though they have the same value because everyone is loved by God. And then we love kindness. We love to treat people kindly, to, to love people even before they love us. And to walk humbly with our God, to listen to God and build a relationship with God. And so when you feel stuck, it can be really hard to feel like you know what to do, right? Sometimes it's really hard. But remember what God says. If you treat everyone well and you love others well and you love God well, those will help you figure out what the next right things to do are. Can you pray with me? God, thanks so much for this time together. Thanks for these kids. Thanks for their heart for you. And we ask that you would continue to remind us how to act justly, how to love others well, and how to love you well. And we ask it in your name. Amen. All right, you guys can go back to your car. You jump down. Jump down, turn around, touch the ground. Awesome. Good job. Oh, here. You want to take this with you? Perfect. Thanks. Well, last Saturday, so not yesterday, but a week ago Saturday, we had the awesome opportunity to meet and greet so many of you. We stood under that portico uh, for, for quite a while on Saturday, and we handed out the most amazing donuts, Larry. They were Country Line Bakery Donuts, right? Country Line Bakery Donuts. These things were like the size of my head. They were awesome. And in the afternoon, we had ice cream, and it really doesn't get any better than donuts and ice cream. Uh, but it wasn't about the donuts. It wasn't about the ice cream. It was about the relationships that we are able to start building. We're able to start to learn some names, to get to know about more about who you are and more about this community. It helps me as a pastor have a better chance to know how to minister with you and alongside of you. And so I am thankful that we had donuts and that we had ice cream. I am thankful that so many of you showed up. And I am thankful that because you give, we are able to do some of those sorts of things to begin a new ministry relationship together. You have the opportunity to give on your way in. You can also give online. You can give digitally. If you call in to the church office, uh, Gene will get you connected with that particular way of giving. But I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for your gifts and I'm thankful for the ways in which you show up. I want to shift now to a moment of prayer. I want to remind you of the many prayer requests on our prayer list. I want to remind you of those prayer requests that are still being held 
very closely and not ready to be shared yet, those you've heard personally, um, and those people haven't even been able to put words to yet. So let us join our hearts and our minds together. Gracious God, we are thankful to be gathered here in your name. We are thankful to be able to enjoy this gorgeous sun, reminding us of the warmth of your love. We are thankful for the technology that allows us to gather together in the midst of a time that can feel a bit unknown, that can feel a bit frustrating or concerning. God, we are thankful that we are here in the midst of your presence, and we ask today, oh God, that your presence would feel real and manifest among us, that we would experience your presence in a real and tangible way. We are thankful, God, for the directions that you continue to give to us, the ways in which you continue to push and challenge and move us, that you don't leave us where we are, but ask us to move along the path. We ask that you would give us courage and boldness and strength to do the hard things that are sometimes the next right thing. We ask that you would remind us of your call to be people who are seeking to usher in your kingdom by changing this world, by being people who are trying to draw others to your love, to your light, to a world that is filled with justice, a world that rejects oppression, a world that seeks to love without condition. We are thankful, oh God, for being here today. We lift up our requests. We lift up the broken places of our hearts. We lift up those aches and groans that haven't yet found words. We ask that you would hold us still in your peace and that you would remind us that you walk with us even in the darkest of the valleys. And we thank you, oh God, as well for those places in which we celebrate, those places that continue to remind us that you walk with us even in the mountain peaks. So thank you, oh God, for being with us, for calling us, for drawing us, for leading us, and for teaching us more about who you are. And we express some of that through the prayer taught to us by Jesus as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Old Testament book of Micah. This is written approximately 700 years before Christ and uh, amazes me that this prophet had such foresight. Starting with chapter 6. Will what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old, Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness? and to walk humbly with your God. We thank you for the word of God in Scripture, the word of God within us, and for the word of God among us. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are thankful to you for your presence here with us, and your presence within us. And we ask now, oh God, this word, this message, may it be of you and from you 
And may our hearts and our ears and our lives be open and ready to receive whatever it is that you have for us this day. Amen. As we wrap up our Into the Unknown series today, I want to share with you about one more song called The Next Right Thing. And it becomes one of the film's defining moments. One of the main characters, Anna, she is struggling through this really difficult moment in her life. I won't share any spoiler alerts, but she's devastated and she is broken. She's like, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I got to figure out what do I do next? And maybe you can relate in your own life. A couple weeks ago, we got to watch the documentary, The Making of Frozen 2, which was so interesting, so fascinating. I highly recommend it. And they were having this conversation with Kristen Bell, and she is the one who voices the character Anna. And the creators had actually spoken to Kristen, and they said, where do you want to see your character go? What do you want to see your, your character explore? And she said, you know, I really would like to know what is she going to do when she doesn't know what to do. And she related it personally to her own struggle with anxiety and with depression. And so she really identified with this piece of music that was moving through these difficult questions. What do you do when you don't know what to do? And as she sings through the song, this voice comes from within her and says, you must go on and do the next right thing. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, this has been a bit of a heavy week. There's a lot going on, a lot weighing on my mind. I imagine yours as well. And we're holding so many things in tension right now. There is grief and anger and fear and frustration. And whether we like it or not, whether we're willing to admit it or not, our lives are a bit upside down right now. And so we've started to ask these questions. What is next? Where do we go from here? How do we respond? How do we cope? What are we going to do? And what is our role as people of faith? Now, this morning's scripture isn't going to answer all of our looming questions for us, but it provides a bit of a compass, a bit of a, a GPS for the modern folk. Micah was considered one of the minor prophets, but only because of the volume of his work that survived. He is not minor with regard to his influence or the importance of his message. Micah was a small town artisan who would have been more comfortable on a factory floor than in a cathedral. He ministered at the same time in the same place as Isaiah. Isaiah was just a little bit older, and Micah was only marginally influenced by Isaiah. But the two of them were among four of the powerhouses that were prophets in 8th century B.C. to Judah. Hosea, Amos, Micah, and Isaiah. The Judah, at the time of Micah's message, was on the verge of annihilation. And Micah saw this on the horizon and felt compelled to speak up. He knew that he had the ability to influence change and to make a difference in the lives of his fellow human beings. The, nat the national situation was at a critical level, and he felt that he needed to speak out. So in an attempt to stave off this annihilation and the way he processed through things, he began to speak out against these societal ills. He spoke against corruption. The morals of the time were appallingly low. There were dishonest government officials across the board. Everyone just had these low ethical standards. And Micah was particularly passionate about fighting for the cause of the oppressed and championing for the welfare of the poor and the needy. The book of Micah then becomes for us a lesson in how to take God seriously. It talks about the difference that religious faith makes in the ways in which we look at life. And Micah acknowledges, he goes, man, there were a lot of religious people in Judah. There were prophets and priests and multitudes of worshipers at the temples and at the altars of Israel. But the difference between their faith and the faith that Micah had was theirs was a static faith. And Micah had this living, personal faith. Then think about a body of water for just a moment. Which is better? Which is healthier? That which is stagnant and real still or that which is fresh and moving? 
It's always better to have that motion, always better to have that movement. It reminds us of the life and the breath and living things. So because of Micah's faith, it sent him great, uh, straight into these great issues of the day. He couldn't just sit back and tolerate the spiritual complacency that was happening because of the formalism of their religion. He had to say something. And so he speaks out and talks about their unhealthy practice of religion. But he does so in such a way that he is drawing people into a healthier relationship with God and with one another. Micah is not one of those prophets that accosts people, but rather lovingly redirects. So let's listen into the story for a moment, a little bit of context. The people are far away from God, and they are experiencing the heartache that comes from that kind of distance. And this passage works to get at why there is that distance. So chapter 6, through Micah the prophet, God says, is it me? Is it something that I have done? Have I worn you down to a place where you are behaving this way? And as the people don't respond, that kind of answer of silence, there's this self-recognition as they think through the things that God has done and they say, God's been faithful. We as a people are the ones who have wandered. So then comes this next line of questioning. He says, hey, let's explore your religious practices. Let's explore your religious practices. And they start this conversation about the effectiveness of ritual sacrifice. So different times throughout the year, people would come to the temple. They would offer sacrifices for different purposes. Maybe they would come because they wanted to commit to following God's will or they wanted to apologize to God or offer thanks to God. And the, the general idea is they want to be in good favor with God, right? They want to appease the gods, it's no different with the Israelites. The people are trying to figure out, what does God want? How do we best make God happy? And we might find ourselves in a similar quandary. We ask ourselves, what does God want of us? But I'm curious, have we stopped to actually ask the question, or do we just assume that we know the answer? You know, do we think it has to do with our worship attendance? or with a certain set of behaviors, or how much we give financially. It's important to stop and ask the question, what does God want of us? Because how we answer that question will change how we engage with our world and our God. So as they begin to explore these religious practices, as they're trying to figure out how they can make God happy, we have to keep in mind there is an underlying assumption that divine favor can be obtained by presenting sacrifices to God. So there's these five questions that begin there in verse 6. The first question, with what shall I come before the Lord? This underlying assumption is I have to have something in hand to bring to God. And then we start to ask, well, what happens if you can't afford to bring something to God? Are you cut off from worship and from God? And he asks the second question, should I bring a burnt offering? And very specifically here in this verse, talks about a year-old calf. This would have been a delicacy, one that could have only been afforded by those who were wealthy. And so it starts the additional line of questioning, can I buy God? Do these particular offerings make a person religious and acceptable to God? The third question drives the point home a little bit further. What if I offer large quantities of rams and oil? I mean, if one ram is good, why not a thousand? And it starts to talk about the excess of wealth. Will that make me religious and acceptable to God? It feels a bit like that scene from Willy Wonka on the Chocolate Factory, the movie with Johnny Depp. And the rich girl is there on the floor with all the squirrels, and she looks up and she says, Daddy! I want a squirrel. And he says, oh, when we get home, I'll get you a squirrel. She goes, no, 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 not just any squirrel. I want one of these squirrels. So he kind of looks at her sideways. He looks at Willy Wonka, pulls out his checkbook and says, how much? 
No amount of money is enough for Willy Wonka because they're not for sale. And some things in life are not for sale, including our relationship with God. And so the underlying answer to all of these questions is no. This is not how you do things. You cannot achieve purity of life and secure God's favor by offering the right combination of things in a ritual. It's not how we do it. And so the line of questions continues. It pushes the issue further. Should I give my firstborn son or the fruit of my body? We've now moved beyond the barn, farm, and orchard. We are straight up dealing with human sacrifice. Some people will go to any length to receive approval and favor, and therefore they were sacrificing their firstborn sons so they could have more children and more prosperity. And God clearly reminded the people, this is a terrible idea. It is absolutely absurd to believe that you can rectify your relationship with God by family-friendly version, sacrificing your child as an offering to God. So this was also a no. As Micah continued to lay out these specific questions before the people, he was highlighting that they believed that blood sacrifice was the key. And even further, it was a blood of the best that a person had, whether it was of their flock or their firstborn. And Micah reminded them that these things, these blood sacrifices are irrelevant to a healthy relationship with God. And he lovingly redirects. And he talks about the real demands of God for humankind, the type that are moral and spiritual in nature. I mean, absent this, ritual means nothing. And this was a huge shift for the people from the minutia of the law into these um, more open-ended types of things. They were used to very specific laws, what to sacrifice, how to sacrifice, when to sacrifice. And what they hear instead from Micah is this trilogy of spiritual qualities that are as social, because our faith is indeed social, as they are personal in nature. And they are each rooted in this personal conviction and attitude that is inextricably linked with our relationship with others. A healthy relationship with God is a both and. God does not require ritual worship. What God requires, as we'll hear in verse 8, is a lifestyle change that makes a difference in our relationships with others. Verse 8, here comes the question, what does God require? How do we get to that place where we have a healthy relationship with God? It says, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? This verse suggests that God has shown what is good a better way, better than offerings, better than personal sacrifices and material sacrifices. It's this threefold deal. We want justice in the daily relationships of life. We want kindness to our fellow human beings. And we want to walk humbly with God. Now you'll notice the first two deal with our relationships with others. It is useless to talk about God unless we have first come to a place where we can respect that God image in one another. 1 John 4 reminds us we are unlikely to love God whom we have not seen unless we have first come to love humankind whom we can see. And this is one of the absolute basic tenets of our faith. If we agree on nothing else, we really can't go too far wrong, whether among humankind or inside of God, if we are able to observe these three fundamentals. And the last question is asked wondering, is this enough? to develop a healthy relationship. It's a challenge when you're used to having this very specific black and white list to something that feels a little more gray. Is that enough for a healthy relationship with God? And not only does the answer come back a resounding yes, but it goes as far as to say nothing more is needed. Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. 
as if it's that simple. Doing justice means restoring broken relationships, restoring fractured communities, working toward a justly ordered society that speaks against abuses of power and privilege, that gives voice to the voiceless. Doing justice means taking care of the disadvantaged and the poor and the marginalized. I mean, keep in mind, God's justice is never punitive. It is never intended to damage or to tear down. God's justice is always restorative. How do we work to bring things back to wholeness? Some days, I think it's a bit easier just to sacrifice a ram. Loving kindness. The Hebrew word here is chesed. It is to love as God loves. To love with a steadfast, steadfastness. To love in spite of flaws and failures. To love with unswerving loyalty. And chesed is not just a feeling, it is an action. This kind of love rescues, chases, and restores. And some days... It just feels like it'd be a lot easier to offer up a couple of gallons of oil. And finally, walk humbly with your God. This world is not about us. This world is not about our agendas. I mean, ultimately, it's about what God wants to do. And if I don't humble myself long enough to listen, then I will miss out on learning how to participate in the things that God is doing. And I tell you what, humility is hard. It requires putting others first and making sacrifices and listening more than I speak. Not having to be the most important person, setting aside ego and having a deference for others. And some days, I think it would be a whole lot easier to offer up my first fruits. But if all it ever took was to toss a ram on the altar, to say a prayer and go back home... I am confident my life would be unchanged. And as hard as it is, I really don't want my life to be unchanged. And I really don't want to live for just me. I don't want to just check in and check out of church and pretend that my relationship with God is okay. I don't want my Sunday morning worship just to be some ritual that I come and check off my list. And I don't want my faith in God to be something that you just see on my bumper sticker or a name that I casually drop in conversation so that you know that I'm a Christian. I want to participate in a faith that asks something bigger of me, that shifts and changes how I see the world, a faith that decentralizes me. A faith that widens my irises and requires something of me. A faith that moves me toward the next right thing. And what is more compelling than doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with my God? And we ask the question, as people of faith, is that enough to guide us? And the answer is an emphatic yes and nothing more is needed. May we each lean into that this day and each day forward. Amen. As a reminder, as you exit, you're welcome to go through the portico and uh, say hello to Pastor Yankee. Uh, as we leave this place, the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious, gracious. Amen, amen. Amen. Go in peace. And now may the God who has blessed us, who has called us to love justice, 
to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God be with you and give you peace. Amen.